sing um, above all Yeah. 
Okay, we're going to end with um, one a little bit faster. So um, you can turn to Our God.
Shall we pray? Our loving Father, we thank you so much for joining us in this worship service, for being here, for wrapping your arms around us in our needs, giving us comfort, blessings, spiritual guidance, and, spe and personal ministry to each of us in our lives. We ask that you would bless us this day, bless those who are participating in the service, guide and direct, and send your Holy Spirit to be, be here as well. We ask these things in Jesus' name, amen. It's my privilege to, to welcome you all here this morning. Uh, we looked like we had quite a few visitors today, so if you're a visitor, can you just raise your hand so we see where you are and you have a special blessing to be here, and we would ask that those that are members, please receive them and welcome them to our service. Um, I would like to welcome those who are worshiping, uh, not in the church, but uh, tuning in to our service as well. Um, may you have a special blessing with us as well. I would like to also take this opportunity to uh, talk to the women for one second. Since I have this pulpit, I decided I would take this minute to um, welcome you and uh, invite you to the Women's Ministries program on May 14. We're going to do a special program, mothers, daughters, grandmothers, aunts, anything. If you have somebody you can tag along. Uh, we're going to do a special mother-daughter thing for uh, Mother's Day. It's the day after Mother's Day on May 14. Um, and Charlotte Creighton, there's an RSVP number to call for Charlotte Creighton. We'd like to see as many as many there. We're, spe we're playing some special craft things for the um, older women, uh, children, as well as the younger ones. So uh, I think you won't want to miss it. So please, even if you don't ever come, haven't ever come, uh, you're absolutely welcome. If you have friends in other churches, please invite them as well. And please um, enjoy and have a blessing this Sabbath day. If your Lord summons you before his presence, how do you respond? Come before him willingly. Then come. Come adore your Lord.
Happy Sabbath, Shabbat Shalom. In Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 21, Jesus cautions us, do not store up for ourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. A basic human need is security, but money doesn't fulfill this need. That is because money itself is not secure. It can be lost, stolen, or wiped out in a bank failure or a stock market crash. If your security is placed in money and you lose the money, you lose your security. Even if you don't lose your money, it still fails to give you true security. It is, in a total economic collapse, money won't help at all. Money in the bank won't shield you from a bank failure. In the event of war, money can, may allow you to move to an uninvolved nation, but it can't stop a bullet or a missile from still reaching you. In a time of famine, money won't let you buy what food there is, but when there is truly no food left, you can't eat your money. Real security, by definition, can only come from something that will always be there for you. Money does not meet this standard, but God does. The only thing that is certain in our world is uncertainty. Our offering today will help provide resources for our church work of pointing people to the true source of security. All security today. All loose offerings today is uh, today we have an offering for our local college church budget. Um, I'd like to ask the deacons to come forward to receive the offering.
Lord, thank you for this offering that you've given, that you've, uh, given to us. Uh, help it to strengthen your work, strengthen the, uh, this church, and help us to be an outreach and to bring more towards you and towards your feelings and, towards you, and to understand you and the blessings that you give us. We ask for your blessings to continue to praise us and to uh, build us up and build up this church as we move forward to the future. Amen. It's, uh, it's, a, it's turned into a beautiful Sabbath day. First sunshine of the whole week. So glad to have you here with us today again. This is our morning prayer time, and uh, we used to sing our prayer song, and we're going to do that, but we're going to be led by the K-4 Browning Element Required. And so we're very pleased with that. Uh, if you have special praise or special petitions that you'd like to come down and be part of our gathering up here for prayer, uh, please feel welcome during this song. But let's stand now as they lead us in singing. hearts and our church, our homes, our schools, our classrooms, each of us, our communities, with your Holy Spirit. Make us to be reflective of Jesus' love and compassion, his kindness and mercy, his unconditional acceptance, and make us more and more like him. We pray that you'll continue to bless our services today, be with our pastor as he opens the word to us, and as we meditate upon that, speak to us as we individually have need. As we kneel here this morning, Lord, we're reminded of all the needs that uh, touch our lives here that are just barely mentioned as we pray. We pray that your great will and wisdom will move in our lives and in our families in just the way we need it most. We won't be mentioning every need, Father, but we know that you know our needs. So help us, Lord, and as we bring our individual needs to you, hear our prayer, O Lord. We also pray specifically for several who have asked for their names to be uh, mentioned in our prayer today. We pray for Betty and Joel, 
We pray for our, my neighbors, Adam and Nick. Pray for James and Beryl, Wayne, Reagan, Roger and Regina, Anne, Phil, Linda, Thor, Joel, and Aiden. We also pray for those who we're connected to who are serving in the military, Bill and Lindsay, Kelsey and Kim and Stephen, and those who are serving abroad and studying abroad, Sandra and Jesse and Haley. We know, Lord, that these are just the tip of the iceberg as far as the needs represented by those of us who have gathered today. Help us as we have need. We pray too, Father, that you'll cleanse us from all unrighteousness, make us pure and clean and keep us that way, not because we're worthy, but because Jesus is. And it's in his name, the name of our Savior, we pray this morning. Amen. The kindergarten through, uh, through grade four students and teachers from Browning Elementary are privileged to be a part of your worship experience this Sabbath morning. It is important to us that our voices and hands work together to find the heart and soul in music. As you have seen, Change My Heart and Nearer Still Nearer are a beautiful way to surround a spoken prayer. Next, we want to speak to the peace, joy, and love that we gain in a closer walk with our best friend, Jesus. We hope you will gain a blessing from the life and fun in these songs. Thank you for supporting our school and the benefits that a Christian education can bring.
time for our children's story if the kids want to come forward at this time. Good morning, boys and girls. How are you doing today? Look at all of these children. It's so great. We want to thank you so much for coming and sharing your talents and your beautiful voices. Such a blessing. It's so important that you guys are doing that kind of thing because you are our church. You're going to lead our church one day, yeah? Are you? Yeah? Good. I have a story to tell you today about a time where I learned a lesson. And... Um, it was kind of, it was, it was a hard lesson for me. To, well, I felt bad about it. I'll just tell you the story. In college, when you go away to college, it's really exciting because it's like 
all of these different opportunities that you have all of a sudden, and your parents aren't like, you know, watching over you all the time, so you get to make them on choices on your own, and hopefully your parents did a good job raising you, so you make the right choices, right? Yeah, because that's really important. So anyway, I go away to college at Southern, and I know that we have some kids back from Southern. Welcome kids back from Southern. Um, and this is my freshman year, and I remember at registration, I was signing into my room and, and getting my room assignment in the dorm, because you all live in a big dorm, and, and, and you have a lot of fun there. And I remember noticing a girl who was kind of off to my right, and she was really kind of quiet, and maybe like a little different, you know? She was just a, maybe a little different and a little quiet. And I remember thinking, as I'm registering, because I was registering with my, one of my friends, and she was all by herself, I thought, you know, I really ought to go say hi to that girl and, you know, introduce myself. Because I bet it's scary for her to be here at college, just like it's scary for me. But she's all by herself. I really, but it was a big line, and I didn't want to go back. And, and so I just waited my turn, and I signed up, and all of that I needed to do. And, and, I, and I didn't go say hi to her. So anyway, school starts, and it's really incredible because you have all of these classes, and they're way harder than high school, and you have all of these new people to meet, and you have all of these cute boys you have to impress, and it just takes a lot of time. And, and so, you know, you just, you're always just going, going. And I remember seeing this girl from time to time. She'd be in the hallway, or she'd sit in the back of one of my classes. And I kept on thinking, you know, I really need to go say hi to her. She looks like she's really you know, kind of like alone. She never had any friends. And nobody was ever talking to her, and she was kind of just a little bit different. And I remember just thinking, I should really, like, you know, become her friend because it's hard in college. But, you know, I was just so busy. I just had so much to do. And then before you knew it, it was like midterms, and that's a bunch of tests that you have to take, and they're really hard, and you have to study, and it's very important to get good grades because your parents will be upset if you don't. And so, you know, I, you know, I studied really hard, and it just never really got around to saying hi. And she actually lived on my floor. There's three floors in the dorm, and she was on the other side, and I knew that. I knew where she lived because I kept on looking for her, and I kept on meaning to go get to know her. But I didn't. And then later, the next semester, I met Mr. Cook. Yeah, and then, and then I really saw nobody after that, <laughs> except for Mr. Cook. I saw a lot of Mr. Cook, yeah. Um, and, you know, that, that was really important because that's my future. Of course, I have to invest in my future, so that took up all my time. And uh, also, you know, you had to study for finals. And so halfway through second semester, I stopped seeing this girl around. And I thought, hmm, that's kind of funny. Like, I, I, don't, I wonder where she is. I didn't see her. She wasn't in my classes that she had been in. She just kind of disappeared. Finally, I like got around to asking one of the deans. I'm like, you know, there's this girl, and she's on my floor, and, and I haven't seen her for a while. And you know what the dean told me? She said, she was having such a hard time here. She knew nobody. She went home, and she dropped out of college. She had no friends, and she was having a really hard time. And you know what? I just felt so bad because I had meant to say hi, I had meant to become her friend, I, I had intended to, but I had never done it because I was just too busy with all of my things. I was so focused on myself. And she dropped out of school, and I don't know what happened to her. I don't even know her name. But she left, and I felt really bad about that. You know, sometimes I think that when we intend to do things and we don't act on them, but God keeps saying, come on, you know, work, you know, you should say hi to this person, you should be nice to this person, you should really listen to that, because that's God telling you. It's really important to take time now to take care of people and to live in the present, right? So next time you feel like God is telling you, you should be nice to that person, or you should play with that person, or you should do something good now, do it now, okay, so that you don't have to learn like me that sometimes it's too late and you don't have the opportunity anymore, all right? You can go back to your seats. Our living word passage of the day is taken from Titus 2, verses 11 through 14. 
For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. Well, once again, we've seen evidence of why we need to do what we need to do. Uh, Carl was probably up there fighting this. Let me uh, apologize, and it's not for Carl. Uh, you probably, I know that the microphones were, they probably tested them prior to the service, and halfway through the service, all of a sudden, the gremlins start running. Uh, it is part of what, what we're doing right now. Uh, within the next week and a half or so, we should be knowing who is going to be the, uh, our advisor in creating a complete new sound system for us. And we're full speed ahead. Uh, as you've already seen, some of the, ramp, uh, the uh, beam repair has begun. Uh, things have been ordered for the kitchen. We are full speed ahead. And uh, the sound system is high priority. And uh, again, I just apologize for our team. They're fighting it. They are just fighting it. And we, we're so sorry that this was kind of messy for you. I appreciate uh, Alexis and, and Richie struggling with it too. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much. Uh, thank you that we can be together. Lord, thank you for uh, the Browning kids this morning, how they've enhanced just us being here, their families and parents, but, but how they've enhanced. And, and Lord, we pray that as they go on, not only for stamina and, and excellence for our staff at Browning and SLA, but Lord, as these kids go on, we just want you to hold Satan a long way away from every one of them. We, we want them protected. We want them to grow in Christ and to, to become astounding in Him. That's what we wish. Guide us as we spend time here together today. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. I was sitting here watching as the Browning kids were singing, and I was sitting there thinking uh, about 40% of the college church budget every month goes down the street. And we don't regret a penny of it. About 40% of what you, what you donate in church budget uh, goes down the street and down to support Browning and SLA, and, and we wouldn't have it any other way. And, and we're so grateful that those families who are here today and your commitment. Uh, grateful that the Trots apparently are having some family reunion or something. What's, what's the story? Everybody just wanted to show up at once? It's not your birthday or anything, Rick? Hunter's birthday? Tucker's birthday? Mr. Tucker! Hey, dude! How you doing? How are the wife and kids? Are they pretty good today? All right. You heading to college next year? All right. <laughs> That's great. I mentioned something at the beginning of the uh, response of this morning, first service, that will just strip your gears if you haven't realized. We are more than one-third of the way through 2012. What? How bizarre is that? I saw a great bumper sticker the other day. It was right here in the post office, the little post office. And any of you who are uh, above a certain age, you'll immediately say, oh yes, amen. It was great. It was a, a wonderful little gentleman. He came slowly moving out, uh, slower than me. He came slowly moving out of the post office and he went to his car. His car was sitting in front of me and he had this wonderful bumper sticker. It said, you may have seen this. I've never seen this before. It was great. It said, inside of every old person, there's a young person saying, what happened? <laughs> Isn't that great? <laughs> what happened? Luke chapter 17, Jesus uh, tells a parable, and a phrase is used, used in there, and the phrase is, Occupy till I come. And learning how to, how to live the occupation. You know, I, I, no matter where you are at, actually, politically, with this whole issue of Occupy Wall Street, Occupy Boston, Occupy Omaha, 
you know, occupy, whatever. Uh, that actually, as far as theologically, that, that movement has helped us because it has, I think for many people, it has helped to redefine the sense of what it means to occupy. Occupy till I come. Occupy, isn't, it, it just isn't existing and enduring and waiting. Occupying till he comes is a proactive engagement of, of claiming that we are going to claim this place until he comes. We're not just going to sit here and, and you know, spin our wheels in this place until he comes. We're going to claim this place until he comes. One of the most majestic stories in the, uh, in the Gospels, without question, is Luke 23, the story of the thief on the cross. Uh, the good guy, not the bad guy. But by the way, You've you got to love the fact that we have all four Gospels because Matthew tells you something that the other three Gospels don't tell you. Only two of the Gospels mention the thieves, really. And Luke is the one that we all quote, we all run after. But Matthew actually tells you something that Luke didn't know or didn't tell you, and it's really, really cool. It tells you that early in the afternoon, early in the day of the crucifixion, that both of the thieves were cussing at Jesus. Both of them. They were snarling and snapping and all this kind of thing. It says that both were railing on him early in the day. But as the day proceeds, the one on the one side starts being transformed. He's starting to see something as the day proceeds, which triggers then that majestic interplay where Jesus literally stopped the progress of the crucifixion, this great schema of the crucifixion in God's plan. Jesus put the pause button in the middle of it to interact with a thief and to grant him this incredible assurance. I'm telling you, paradise is yours. What a, what a majestic moment. And, and it's one of the sweet stories, of course, of the gospel where we sit there and we think, I mean, this guy, he's, he's that close. I mean, you know, he's that close. Hell is already licking at his ankles. Man, he's that close. And Jesus grabs him for the kingdom. Now, have you ever put yourself into the sandals of the thief? Granted, he didn't last a whole lot longer after that. They smashed, uh, shattered his legs, and he struggled and suffered pretty quickly. Have you ever stopped to think that if the guy would have had any time, what would life have been for him? If he'd had, even had three days that he could have survived beyond the suffocation of you know, shattering his legs and, and not being able to lift his weight and all the things that come to pass in that and maybe the, the bleed out, the exsanguination of, of you know, shattering his legs. I don't know. You know it, we know it precipitated, it hastened his death intentionally. That's why they did it. But if he would have been given time, if he would have been given two days, five days, you know, what would he have done? What would he have done with the moments? The one who was given that magnificent gift. Um, there are certain people in the Bible that, that are really, I just, I love them. There are some others I'm not so energized. I, I admitted in first service this morning, I'm not so jazzed by David, I'm sorry. I just, I, I have a hard time with David. You know, he's God's friend, and I accept that, but I, I have a hard time with David. And there's some others. David, David's just too moody for me. <gasps> just up, down, up, down. He's so moody and things like this. But uh, there are certain people in the Bible who generally either fall between the cracks or they, they have a quirky personality or something like this that I'm really drawn to these guys. And one of them without question to me is Aaron. I love Aaron. I just find Aaron astounding. In Exodus chapter 5 is the first awareness that there's this older brother back there in slavery and he's going to become Moses' right hand. And so Moses comes back and he is reintroduced to somebody he hasn't seen in decades and decades and decades. And he becomes Moses' right hand. Then in Exodus 25, the Lord points and he says, he isn't just going to be sort of your prime minister. He's going to be something more. He's going to be what you could never be, Moses. He's going to be unique among all the people. And so he's set aside for this ordination 
as the great priest. That's the good news. The bad news is in Exodus 32, he withers like a wet noodle against the pressure of the nation and he creates a golden calf. And then he comes up with his childish excuse as to why when Moses challenges him. In Leviticus 10, we're introduced to his weasley nature with regard to his sons. He's got these two boys and he just never quite gets around to giving them boundaries. And he ends up paying a heavy price because of it in Leviticus chapter 10 with the loss of his two sons. And, and by the way, one of the most dramatic moments in the Exodus story happens there in Leviticus 10. It isn't just the death of Nadab and Abihu. It is what he is commanded as far as what his response is to be. Moses looks at Aaron and says, you just lost your two sons. And you know what? When you're out there in front of the people, you take it like a man. You say amen to the judgment of God when you're in front of the people. Back when you're in your own tent, you can scream, you can swear, you can cry, you can act like you, know, you don't understand God. But when you're out in front of the people, you're the high priest. So you hold your grieving because you stand before them in the place of God. What a demand. He wasn't allowed to grieve publicly. That's Leviticus chapter 10. Numbers chapter 12, he and his sister Miriam start snarling and griping and complaining and whining about Moses and leadership, and it's really dumb. It is so dumb. It, it says they start uh, questioning because of this alien wife of Moses. Oh, come on. Moses had been married to her for decades. You, you can't be serious. That's just the thing they happened to jump on. They had bigger issues going on. And God responds immediately. Have you noticed? Miriam gets leprosy. Aaron doesn't. Think about it. What's up with this? Is this part of that you know, macho, male, chauvinist, Bible, anti-female, you know, kind of agenda that some people... Is that what's going on? Is it because she's female? Because Eve ate the apple first? Nah. Come on. These people were flesh and blood. Years ago, in 1876, there was a poem that was called Voluntaries Three. And in it, I believe it was Emerson, Ralph Waldo Emerson, I think, uh, in it, he said, we are now at the 100th anniversary of America, 1876. A lot of us lived through the bicentennials, 1976. We are at the 100th anniversary of America. And he says, I'm looking down the span of time, and I'm thinking about the people who will be alive when America is 200 years old. And you know what? I have this feeling you're going to think we weren't real. The people a hundred years ago weren't real flesh and blood and, they, and we didn't really feel things and the sun wasn't warm on our face and the flowers weren't beautiful to us. Everything was black and white and ugly. That's what you're going to think about us. And he says, I want you to know a hundred years from now. It, was, it wasn't voluntary history. It was called Upon a Centennial Celebration. I'm sorry, Upon a Centennial Celebration. That's the title of the poem. And, and he, he said, a hundred years from now, I want you to look back and I want you to recognize we fell in love in the spring. We heard the birds in the morning. Our life is as real to us as yours will be to you a hundred years from now. And sometimes I think we do that with people. We tend to think, you know, back in the old days, that wasn't real. Come on, they had feelings and emotions and personalities. And so go back and ask yourself, what's this thing with Miriam getting leprosy and Aaron doesn't? And I have a feeling there's actually two possible answers. One, he was the high priest. And if a priest is blemished, he must be removed. God was only sustaining him because he was the priest. If he hadn't been the priest, he'd have received it too. A blemished priest could not serve. But then think about it. If you're Aaron and if you have any conscience at all, 
you have to look at your sister with her leprosy and realize, I deserve it too. And it ain't fair that I don't have it. And the guilt that Aaron would have to carry because he knows he deserves it too. And he doesn't get it. And his sister has to carry it all. And you wonder which one would actually have the heavier burden. And up till now, you're sitting here saying, wait a minute, I thought you told us five minutes ago you really like Aaron. You think he's a pretty good guy. I do. I find him astounding. Because there was something, he learned a lesson somewhere. In spite of his failure at the golden calf, in spite of his failure with his sons, in spite of his failure with his criticism, with his sister, somewhere along the line, he learned a lesson. He learned what it meant to occupy. To proactively occupy. Maybe it was that once a year in before the presence of the Lord in a way that nobody else could ever go. There was something that transformed him slowly that is astounding. So much so that when you come to Numbers chapter 16, it is the pinnacle moment of Aaron's life. The nation's under judgment. Some plague is rolling across the camp. God says to Moses and Aaron, get out of my way. I'm going to smoke them. And if you read number 16, it's almost like Moses panics. Moses doesn't know how to respond. And it's like he shouts across four tenths away to Aaron, do something! Aaron, do something! God's going to destroy them all. And the Bible says that Aaron, when Moses couldn't, Aaron ran into the sanctuary. He grabbed a hold of the little incense pot. He came running out. He held it up in front of God and he said, Stop right there! And God relented. Aaron commanded the death angel to halt. And God obeyed. What a moment. The guy of the golden calf, the guy who's criticizing his brother, the guy who doesn't discipline his sons, something had happened to him that brought him to that moment that was majestic. Somehow, learning how to live it means learning how to live it today. Maybe someday down the line, there's going to be a pinnacle moment of your life. You don't know what it is. None of us know that great watershed moment. You and I, I unless you're an absolute drama queen, every moment of your life isn't a crisis. Every day isn't a crisis. There was a major league relief pitcher one time who said, If you live every day, if you make everything to be a life and death experience, you're going to die a lot of times. You know? Every day is in a crisis. You and I never can predict when the crisis moment is going to come in life, when you are given that chance for that one astounding ultimate point of your life. We never see it coming, we never know when it's coming. And the decisions that we make every progressive day leading up to it will determine what happens at that moment. Something in the progress of Aaron brought him to that moment of number 16, which had not been predictable up to that point in any way. Occupy. We've got to, somehow we've got to learn what it means to live today proactively, well, with an incredible balance between Philippians 2.13, He will work to do in you His good pleasure, and 1 John 1, you choose to live in the light. You know, my choice balanced with God's ability. 
God is, God is always capable, but my choice is wh- whether I will abide in the presence, whether I will choose to live in the light, whether I will make today the day that contributes to whenever that moment comes. Please turn with me to one passage, and we will close with this. 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians. It's like Pastor Heather said in, in the story with the kids. When are we going to get around to it? What am I waiting for? If I have this hope and this goal of doing something right, doing noble, and being generous, and being faithful, and being an excellent steward, and, and being a better dad, and exactly when am I going to get around to it? The bulletin cover sentence is from one of my three closest friends in the world. He's an evangelical covenant pastor, Richard Parrish. And this is on Richard's desk. I see it every time I'm in his home, in his office. If I wait till tomorrow to write my book, my book is never going to get written. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 1 and 2. We then, as workers together with him, beseech you also that you receive not the grace of God in vain. Don't get all that God has given for nothing, in vain, because he has said, I have heard the time accepted, and in the day of salvation I have succored thee. Behold, it's today. It's today. The day that you're supposed to be a kinder person is today. The day you're supposed to be a better teacher is today. The day that you're supposed to be a more patient mother is today. The day that you're supposed to be more efficient in your work is today. The day that you're to be better committed to Jesus is today. It's not for some moment down the line. Now is the day. It is his wish to get it done in you. It is your job to stay in it with him. And that doesn't mean six weeks from now or at some moment of crisis. What part of your house have you intended to clean? What you doing tomorrow? Maybe it's time to clean it. What book did you mean to read to your grandkid? Go home and find the thing and read it. What letter did you intend to write that needs, it's just waiting to be written? Get on the computer. Today is the day of salvation. Don't wait for the explosion. Our closing hymn is hymn number 594.
I know that because of our uh, traditional emphasis on Advent, 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 Second Coming, that at times the temptation is to you know try to get get us moved with the anticipation of the return. And the truth is that not many of us can sustain intensity long term. Intensity takes a toll on us. You know, we can, we can kind of get frantic and intense, you know, for short bursts, but after a while, it just, you know, we don't have the makeup to do it long term. And that's why I believe this, this verse, this passage, occupy. Learn what it means to occupy. Claim the territory today. Because when it's time to claim it for real, you'll be well practiced. Jonathan Edwards wrote on his 18th birthday, I am determined as of this day that I will never do anything this day that I would not do if I knew it was the last day of my life. That's how I will live this day. Occupy well. What are we waiting for? Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you that you have pulled us into your, your grand plan. You did not abandon us. You drew us in and you made us part of your inertia and your initiatives. And Lord, the kingdom only will expand in our sphere as we become the ones through whom he gets it done. It is, it is, it is in him to, to will and to do his good pleasure in us. And we want that to be our, our motto, our theme, and ultimately, if it has to be, our epitaph. He got it done in us. These things we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you.